Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the CILE Academy and today's guest lecture by Dr. Kodula Droga um, on contemporary challenges to international humanitarian law. Today's lecture is scheduled to last approximately 60 minutes with a lecture followed by a Q&A. Allow me to now hand you over to our E Academy co-director, Professor Patricia galvao -Tillet. Thank you so much and uh, welcome um, again to another Wednesday guest lecture. Today we have the great pleasure of having with us uh, Cordula Droga. She's uh, um, a good uh, friend from the um, International Law Commission in Geneva because she's been also hosting us uh, in uh, regular meetings that we have between the Commission and, uh, and the ICRC. And um, she uh, has come today um, virtually to speak to you uh, about contemporary challenges of uh, international humanitarian law. And um, we are very pleased to have her with us. Um, uh, Cordula Draga, she's the chief legal officer and head of the legal division of the ICRC, uh, where she leads the ICRC efforts to uphold, implement, and develop international humanitarian law. Uh, she has joined the ICRC um, back in 2005 and had a number of positions both in the field and in the headquarters, um, including as head of the legal advisors to operations and most uh, recently as uh, chief of staff uh, to the president of the um, International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, she has um, uh, some 20 years of experience in the field of international law and in her earlier career she worked uh, for the International Commission of Jurists um, in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and in the Max Planck Institute uh, for International Law. So again, as it's been our trademark, uh, we have uh, um, looked to invite people that have both solid academic background but also a hands-on experience on the topics and uh, as, um, as a, a chief legal officer and head of the legal uh, division of the ICRC, uh, she is really the right person to be talking to you today about the uh, legal challenges uh, to IHL, um, to political legal challenges to IHL, um, and um, uh, also uh, namely from a perspective from the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, so uh, with um, a great pleasure, Cordula, we welcome you on behalf of Nilofer and myself and of the Academy, and the floor is yours, and uh, we look forward to this discussion afterwards with you. Thank you very much, Patricia, and thank you for inviting me. Now, I'm very, very sorry because it seems like works have just started in our building and I was promised yesterday that this would not be the case. So I hope it's just a few minutes and then it's not going to go on. Can people hear me despite the horrible background? Okay, let's hope this works. I'm very sorry about this. Um, so I've been asked to talk to you about a bit uh, contemporary challenges to international humanitarian law. So I will do so by, on the one hand, talking about IHL, but also talking about what it is that, um, you know, marks conflicts today and what it is that we see as, as humanitarian issues. Because the way the ICRC anyway um, approaches international humanitarian law is always first and foremost through the prism of what is the humanitarian concern of today and of tomorrow possibly. So I will now share my screen with the PowerPoint presentation. And I think it will work. We just tested it. Um, resume slideshow, voila. So I think here we go. And so to start um, a bit with uh, what I will try to talk to you about in the next 20 minutes or so, and then we can uh, move to a, to a Q&A, is to, to paint this picture of, of what conflicts look like today and what seem to us important challenges. And I, I think you have received as background reading our report of the last International Conference of the Red Cross and um, Red Crescent, uh, in which we, we set out these challenges and, and the IHL aspects of it. You, of course, don't need to read all of it. It's about 60 pages long. But as a reference document, if you ever want to look up uh, any of those topics, you will perhaps and hopefully find some interesting information there. Now, wars today are increasingly urban. 
uh, and they are increasingly long. Uh, the ICRC um, is present in, in around um, um, in, in some uh, uh, 60 conflicts in, in about 40 countries. Um, and what we see is that on average, we are present in such conflicts for 30, 40 years. Uh, when you think of conflicts like Afghanistan, conflicts like in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, also even uh, Syria, you know, Syria is a conflict that's almost 10 years long now, um, and so forth. Iraq is a, is a country that has been at conflict for decades. And so, um, and so there are particular challenges for the populations in such conflicts because, of course, their whole um, infrastructure is being destroyed slowly, slowly, and um, their whole social fabric is also being uh, eroded. And conflicts are increasingly urban just simply by the fact of, of global dem demographics. And um, as the world urbanizes, so do conflicts. And I will perhaps start with this challenge of urban warfare. We saw that particularly over the last um, decade, perhaps, because of the, of the conflict in the Middle East, but not only. Also, for instance, if you think of Ukraine, um, these are conflicts that move into middle income countries, countries that are urbanized. Syria is one of the most urbanized countries. Um, and these, these urban warfare situations bring their own specific challenges for uh, the populations with them. Why? Because urban, urban centers are actually strategic centers and they will become more so. It is important for belligerents to hold cities or to capture cities. You probably saw this um, very recently in the conflict around Nagorno-Karabakh and there were a couple of towns there that were of great importance to the belligerents. And what this means is that these towns are attacked, the populations in these towns will suffer, they will displace. And the specificity about urban, uh, about urban uh, settings is, of course, the density of the population and the intermingling of uh, military targets and, um, and fighters with uh, the dense civilian population. And um, this intermingling means that there is more likelihood that civilians will be hurt. And there is, um, there is evidence and there are statistics, particularly by uh, an organization called Action on Armed Violence, that in such conflicts, it's really 90% um, of, of those um, who die and, and are injured are, are civilians. Um, there's also another specificity about urban warfare, which is that it is uh, that the population is very dependent on essential services, which themselves are dependent on critical infrastructure. So essential services, for instance, like medical care, are uh, dependent, of course, on water and electricity. And this critical infrastructure is so intertwined and so dependent on specific nodes that if in an urban setting one of those nodes it hit, is hit, it has extreme domino effects on other parts of that infrastructure, but on also on other infrastructure and by domino effect and reverberating effects on essential services. And so, for instance, if an electricity node is, is hit, this will not only cut the electricity, it will also cut the water supply. It will, and if electricity and water is cut, for instance, in a hospital, then, of course, the consequences uh, for uh, uh, for medical care are, are um, devastating, and this is what we see in, in urban conflicts today. The other thing that, that we see is, again, because of the density of the population and the fact that many people live in cities, when you have then displacement from those places, it is very quickly very high numbers. As you saw recently in the last town that was um, fought around in, in Nagorno-Karabakh, you had 100,000 displaced. In, in the space of, in, in a very little uh, time space. Now, one of the main causes of civilian death and destruction is the use of explosive weapons with a large impact area in populated areas. So, I mean, of course, most weapons are explosive um, and it is not a problem as such, 
However, where it becomes a problem is when, in fact, the destructive radius of a weapon is much wider than the actual military target that the weapon wants to, uh, that the weapon is intended to hit. This can be either because when the weapon explodes, you have a blast and fragmentation uh, range that is much broader than, than the military target. You also have, so for instance, the la large bombs, you know, with large munitions have this effect of a large blast and fragmentation range, which destroys um, a lot around them. You also have weapons which have a lack of um, accuracy in their delivery systems. So very often this is the case for artillery. Um, you have so-called area, artillery, for instance, is a so-called area weapon, which is meant to saturate an area with munitions. It is not meant to hit one precise target. And in fact, it is used several times in order to, um, to achieve its, its military objective. And there again, you then, of course, have an area that is saturated with explosive force that is much broader than the actual military target you're trying to hit. The same is true for, um, for weapons that deliver multiple munitions, such as, for instance, multi-barrel rocket launchers. And so these weapons aren't a problem when they are used in an open area in an open battlefield, but when they are used in a densely populated area where the military target that is being targeted, and we are now assuming, of course, that there is no deliberate indiscriminate attack, but that there is an intent to hit a military target. Nonetheless, because of this density of the um, of the infrastructure, but also the population, you will have, of course, a high likelihood of indiscriminate effects in the sense that this weapon um, and the munitions will hit the military target and the civilians and civilian infrastructure indiscriminately, and that they can actually not be targeted precisely at the military uh, objective that they are trying to target. And so these inherent accuracies uh, also of certain types of weapons create um, great suffering and great destruction in cities. And coming back to the consequences and the reverberating effects that I was talking to you about, for us, it is one of the areas of armed conflict that is the most challenging and that needs to be addressed because it is, from the perspective of the International Committee of the Red Cross, not acceptable that uh, the suffering in, in urban warfare continues to be as high and the toll of civilians and the ratio of civilian death and destruction as high as it has been in these last um, decades. And therefore, the ICSC is calling for an avoidance of the use of explosive weapons in populated areas unless mitigating measures can be taken to reduce the civilian harm. So, for instance, the timing, um, the use of um, lower yield munitions, um, the use of more accurate uh, systems, the avoidance of specific um, types of, of um, such weapons and so on. So we are uh, working at the moment um, just as much as, as, as some others to uh, bring concrete um, recommendations as well based on best practices that already exist by armed forces that are trying to avoid such suffering um, to try to share those practices and hopefully create a situation where um, more measures can be taken to avoid uh, such suffering in urban warfare. As I said to you before, the, the you know, wars are urban, wars are long. And I won't dwell too much on this, but um, from, the, from the perspective of international humanitarian law, I think it's important to say International humanitarian law doesn't really have um, a limited time frame of applicability. So it will apply as long as the conflict lasts. And this is important, of course. Um, but at the same time, international humanitarian law is probably also um, focused traditionally on the more basic needs of the population. And so, on the one hand, we need to 
nonetheless use the concept of international humanitarian law and the concepts that it has about basic needs um, to accommodate also the needs of populations in long-term armed conflicts, so not just in emergency situations. And this is possible through uh, much of the interpretation of such concepts. Of course, uh, the law of occupation in itself is not uh, is, is already a, a, a law that that envisages a certain uh, time, you know, a certain length uh, of occupation. Otherwise, you wouldn't need this this concept of law. But you will also have things like basic needs, which can be um, understood to be emergency needs. But of course, they can also be basic needs of nutrition of um, uh, maternal and child health care, etc., when the conflicts become longer and these um, these things become important and, and actually acute needs of, of the population. You know probably um, that uh, we have an all-time high um, since the Second World War of internally displaced persons and refugees uh, in the world. There are today over 15 million internally displaced persons in the world, and of the of the ten um, countries that have the highest numbers of internally displaced persons, all of those ten, except Venezuela, are armed conflict situations. So Syria, Afghanistan, Myanmar, the DRC, Iraq, and so on, Yemen, and so on. And so there's a clear link, of course, between conflict and internal displacement. And it's very important to remember that. IHL not only contains rules um, that protect the civilian population from internal displacement by the fact that it protects civilian population from direct attack, but also from dis indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks. And that if those rules were respected, displacement would already be reduced. We know um, from speaking to uh, people who are displaced that it is very often when the bombs start falling that they will have to flee. They don't have a choice anymore. Um, but they, it also protects people once they are displaced. Um, it protects them in their basic need for shelter, um, medicines, um, nutrition, and so forth. Uh, it also ensures that they have a right to return uh, to their place of origin as soon as the um, reasons for the displacement have, um, have disappeared. And yet we know, and again, it comes back to my point on urban warfare, that people remain displaced for long, for a long time, sometimes for decades. Um, and this also has to do with the destruction and the fear in their places of origin and the fact that they cannot actually return. And in these urban conflicts that we see today, the saturation of cities with explosive remnants from the fighting is another reason for them not to be able to come back to their places of origin. You will find also, and I won't go too much into it, in our report on the challenges of contemporary armed conflicts, the particular issue of persons with disabilities. This is something on which IHL in one way was a precursor because it has always, in the Geneva Conventions and additional protocols, taken into account the needs of persons with disabilities, um, with, however, a somewhat um, outdated concept of, of disability and, and somewhat outdated vocabulary. Um, and so we need to interpret and adapt uh, this vocabulary to also contemporary understandings of, um, of disabilities. And I think particularly the fact that originally in IHL, disability was much more conceived as a medical issue. Whereas of course today, and particularly also through all the work done um, around the Convention on the Persons uh, with Disabilities, we understand disability to be much more a question of social inclusion. And so this is also a way in which we can, we can learn and have to interpret international humanitarian law in light of contemporary concepts and understandings. Um, I will, I will um, not dwell too much on, on children's access to ed education, but just to say as well that um, fortunately there is um, an increasing awareness 
of the loss of education through conflict from children. Um, IHL addresses this. IHL actually addresses education as a basic need of children and both the Forced Geneva Convention as well as additional protocol um, to ensure that parties to the conflict have to ensure the education of, of children throughout the conflict and at all times. Um, and as you will know, uh, there is also um, a document now, uh, um, a non-binding document called the Safe Schools Declaration, which, um, which comes to complement these basic rules of IHL, create more awareness and, and hopefully strengthen the protection of education in, in armed conflict. I, of course, cannot do this lecture without also talking about the pandemic, which we are currently um, facing. And perhaps simply to say that from the ICRC's perspective, COVID-19 is a protection crisis, not only a medical crisis. Um, it compounds the vulnerabilities of populations that are already uh, weakened from years of conflict. And today and this and next year, probably you will see more deaths from hunger than from COVID itself. And you will see a lot of those um, economic hardships, hunger, starvation in conflict situations. IHL would provide a minimum framework of protection to all persons in armed conflict, and it would even protect them also in the in the context of such a pandemic. Um, and I think it's important to realize, and this is why I insist on this protection crisis, many of those populations would be less weak and less vulnerable to the pandemic had the belligerents respected their obligations under international humanitarian law in the past decades, had they not destroyed the infrastructure, the hospitals, the medical care, had they allowed humanitarian access, humanitarian relief to um, to reach the populations in need. And so today we are faced with a population that is weak because of the lack of respect of IHL. And we can only uh, hope that uh, this is a wake up call and that IHL should be better respected in order also to protect those populations. You will um, find if, if you go on the internet quite a few documents by the International Committee of the Red Cross also that will give you more indications on how IHL is re relevant for the pandemic. Interestingly, uh, you might or might not know, but there are actually even rules, for instance, on um, prisoners of war, which address specifically the obligation of the belligerents to take measures in detention to um, curb uh, contagious diseases and epidemics. Um, so, so this is something that's actually already envisaged visaged by international humanitarian law. And the other thing that I think is interesting and important to keep in mind for populations in conflict is that, of course, now with this race for a vaccine and hopefully um, uh, soon um, advances and, and hopefully vaccines um, coming um, and becoming uh, available, it will be important that those vaccines also reach populations that are perhaps um, left behind, that are perhaps behind front lines, that are perhaps under the control of parties that are not necessarily politically the most accepted parties, um, and that medical care, including vaccinations, um, is imparted impartially uh, and without discrimination to all persons uh, in conflict outside of conflict situations, of course, but also in conflict situations. And um, my colleague, uh, Alexander Breitika, has recently written a, a blog post that you might find interesting if you ever need to know how IHL um, imposes an obligation on parties to distribute uh, vaccines indiscriminately. It also protects medical uh, infrastructure, including those infrastructures that will develop vaccinations. It also protects medical personnel. And this is very important because what we have seen in certain conflicts is that medical personnel is attacked because of the stigma and the, the high emotions, of, if you will, uh, attached to, uh, to the pandemic. And, um, and lastly, it also protects medical ethics and it protects those that will treat people um, for the disease, uh, for the virus, and also those who will vaccinate people um, to do so according to medical ethics um, and no other criteria other than 
the medical need and not political affiliation, um, uh, religious affiliation, and so on. So this is, uh, this is, I think, an important framework also in armed conflicts to deal with this pandemic. We now move to, um, no, I will actually do it the other way around. I will first still move to um, non-state armed groups because again, we have here a challenge of contemporary armed conflicts that is, um, that is important um, and is a reality of the majority of conflicts because as you know, uh, most conflicts around the world are non-international armed conflicts, meaning they are conflicts that oppose states against non-state armed groups um, or indeed non-state armed groups uh, amongst each other. So if you think about conflicts like uh, Myanmar, Afghanistan, uh, Syria, Yemen, etc., these are all non-international armed conflicts. And um, what we have seen in the past decade is really a multiplication and fragmentation of such armed groups. And most of the conflicts involve more than two, three or four armed groups, but actually a myriad of armed groups. And this actually creates quite a few um, challenges in order to classify the conflict and to know who is actually a party to the conflict. And in particular, that's the case when you have um, groups that are sort of horizontally organized, as is often a, an existing phenomenon. If you think, for instance, of conflicts like Libya, conflicts like Syria, you have very many small groups and they're often under an umbrella. And so it's not very clear um, who is a party to the conflict. Do these groups form one non-state armed groups within the meaning of international humanitarian law or several armed groups within the meaning of international humanitarian law? And it's also important and what we see is you often have um, multiple attempts, of course, to, um, to have peace agreements or, or ceasefires, etc. And so the question then is who still remains a party to the conflict, who doesn't? You see this in Mali, where the, where the um, government has um, you know, got peace agreements with some of the groups, but not others. But then, of course, out of those groups that have a peace agreement, you always I mean, almost invariably then have a splinter group that will take up the fighting again. We're seeing this in Colombia, we're seeing this in Nigeria. And so um, the sheer application of, you know, the very clear framework of international humanitarian law to extremely complex and messy situations of, of non-state armed groups is, is a real challenge in, in, in the real world. And what we also uh, see is that millions of people. Um, there's an estimation about 60 million. I don't know if it's true. It might be 40, it might be 60, but millions of people live in territory under the control of non-state armed groups. So for instance, if you think about Eastern Ukraine, if you think about parts of Libya um, and so forth. And so this creates really questions about what are the obligations of no those non-state armed groups towards the civilians under their control? And again, this is also a question about uh, the pandemic and the COVID pandemic, because many of those groups have actually taken lockdown measures, if you will. And so what are the obligations of those groups towards uh, the populations under their control? Um, under IHL, uh, as parties to the conflict, they have to ensure the basic needs of populations under their control. But this, of course, is very dependent on their capacity to also do so on the amount of control they exercise. And then an interesting legal question um, that is much debated is, if IHL only deals really with um, the situation of conflict and not so much with the governance of um, a territory, with the relationship between a government and its citizens, as it were, as human rights law do, then to what extent are non-state armed groups bound or not by human rights obligations? And then lastly, um, a very important question that is is a real headache, I would say, is the question about detention by non-state armed groups. Many non-state armed groups detain people. Um, the rules in Common Article 3 and when applicable additional Protocol 2 are relatively scant uh, and give uh, relatively little indication on, on the obligations, although that's also the case for, for states, of course. Um, but again, what is the capacity of non-state armed groups who sometimes move around every day in order not to be found, who sometimes themselves have very little to eat, 
to feed themselves, to um, to close themselves, very little shelter. What is the obligation of such groups towards the prisoners they take? And also importantly, one of the basics of um, the law uh, governing detention in IHL is contact with the outside world and families. And the question there is, when non-state armed groups are trying to hide, then how are they going to ensure the contact with the families um, of, of the detainees? And these are practical questions that, uh, that are real challenges for, for respect of, of international humanitarian law. Talking about non-state armed groups, um, this leads me of also, of course, almost inevitably to um, the question of terrorism, counter-terrorism measures, and IHL. Almost any non-state armed group is designated as a terrorist group by the government that it is fighting. Um, and this is of concern because it can lead perniciously to a dehumanization of not only the members of the group, but also the civilians that are associated or affiliated with the group or living under the control of that group, or perhaps having political affinities with the group without being fighters themselves. Um, and so it's very important for us, and this is a discourse that the ICRC has been holding for many, many years, but I think we always need to repeat it, that um, international humanitarian law is applicable to states fighting terrorists uh, or non-state armed groups that they designate as terrorists. IHL prohibits acts that qualify as terrorist acts. Uh, it prohibits also acts such as hostage taking, uh, deliberate targeting of civilians and so forth. So terrorism, terrorist acts as such are anathema to IHL. And IHL requires actually um, that they should not remain um, unpunished. It requires them as war crimes to be prosecuted and punished. But it also requires those who are fighting terrorists to abide by the rules of IHL. And this is mainly pro to protect their own civilian population. Because what IHL does is that it protects the humanity of your enemy, for instance, when the enemy is detained or hors de combat, and it protects the civilian population from the fighting and from the effects of hostilities. And this should hold true uh, whether you are fighting any non-state armed group, including non-state armed groups that you are uh, have designated as terrorists. Importantly also, but we can come back uh, to that in the question and answer if you are interested, um, the counter-terrorism discourse, which has become uh, which has not at least lessened, let, let's say, um, has led also to a density of international and national legal frameworks that have had uh, the unintended side effects to limit humanitarian action in the sense that humanitarian action is at risk of being seen as material support to terrorism. And uh, it is important to leave that humanitarian space even uh, in the fight against terrorism. And I can say more about that if some of you are interested during the Q&A. I will now just briefly say something about the challenges of today and tomorrow, let's say. Uh, and I will, I will not focus on all of them, but just um, on two. But just to mention, you have, of course, uh, new technologies of warfare have always um, changed the nature of conflicts. Um, and they have always been a subject matter of development of international humanitarian law. Um, and today what we see is, of course, cyber operations being more and more present in, in armed conflict situations. We see um, more and more development in uh, autonomous weapon systems. We see artificial intelligence making its way to the battlefield. We, um, we see the potential use of weapons in outer space. And I will focus on, on two of those only, which are cyber operations and autonomous weapon systems. Uh, and I can come back to others if, if uh, should, you, should participants be interested or wish to. Now, again, as I said, the International, uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross looks at new technologies of warfare through the prism of their potential human cost, humanitarian effects. And to that effect, um, in the cyber realm, we haven't really seen great 
um, humanitarian consequences of cyber operations in conflict yet, even though we have seen that belligerents have uh, resorted to cyber operations such as to disrupt networks in conflict situations such as Syria or the Ukraine. However, what we have seen is um, the potential effects of such cyber operation. And in particular, um, when we um, convened experts to analyze the potential human cost of cyber operations, we see two things that we can learn from cyber attacks that are being launched outside of armed conflict situations. One is the vulnerability of industrial systems. So electricity systems, water network systems, but also nuclear uh, power plants. All of these systems have been the subject of attack. They are usually very resilient, um, which means that cyber attacks against such systems um, are usually, have not been devastating because these systems have mechanisms to be resilient and to function even if one of their parts is attacked. But what we have also seen, and this is of concern, is um, a rise uh, in the number of such attacks and a rise that is higher than that was anticipated by experts a few years back. And the other thing that experts tell us, and this we have seen recently, is the vulnerability of healthcare systems. Healthcare systems have, um, have um, digitalized very quickly hospitals, but other also all sorts of medical um, um, treatments have been digitalized. And these systems are extremely vulnerable to cyber attacks because they, the, the security has not followed these developments. And we've seen many attacks um, during the COVID pandemic, including on hospitals, for instance, that were um, doing research or that were treating COVID patients. And we have even uh, recently heard of a first attack on a hospital um, in Germany, where then a patient died because um, the electricity was cut off and that patient could not be transferred quickly enough. And this is just a glimpse of what it could be in armed conflict if healthcare systems were attacked. Now, um, there is a dispute among states whether IHL even applies uh, to cyber operations. For the ICRC, it's very clear that in armed conflict situations, cyber operations are means and methods of warfare, and therefore IHL has to restrict uh, their use and uh, protect civilians against uh, indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks of cyber operations, and belligerents have to respect those. Um, I will leave it at that and with this very basic message for you uh, now during the presentation. Um, but just to say, of course, the question then is, so how do we interpret international humanitarian law um, in such situations? Um, and that's where, you know, the devil is in the detail and we can come back to that uh, should you wish to. Lastly, autonomous weapon systems, as I said, these are weapon systems that, are, that already exist. But there is really a race, an arms race in this, in this area for autonomous weapon systems. The issue here is autonomous weapon systems, as we understand them, are weapon systems in which there is no human intervention at the point of targeting. So the weapon is triggered and it then decides for itself on the base of, basis of algorithms that have been computed into it, who, when and where uh, will be targeted. And this creates um, concerns, both in terms of international humanitarian law, um, about in particular the obligations of um, respecting uh, the principles of distinction and proportionality, but also ethical uh, questions because of the loss of human agency uh, in taking life. And so um, the ICRC has called for limits uh, at the international level, agreed at the international level on autonomous weapon systems in order to ensure respect for IHL and in order to address ethical uh, concerns and humanitarian concerns. Um, this is something that, again, is um, contentious, but is being discussed uh, in the um, mark of the Convention on um, Conventional Weapons. And at the last uh, meeting of, of governmental experts, we were heartened to see that there was, um, there seemed to be convergence of views about the need for human control or human 
um, judgment being kept in the use of autonomous weapon systems. And um, in our view, this is a, a, a good uh, uh, a good sign, and we are hoping that um, states will be able to agree to limits on autonomous weapon systems in that um, in that realm. I will conclude by just talking uh, for a minute about enhancing respect for international humanitarian law. I've talked to you about specific challenges, urban warfare, um, non-state armed groups, long conflicts, uh, new weapon systems, etc. But the single most important challenge to international humanitarian law remains it's the lack of respect for it and the and the human cost of warfare that we see and that we are convinced could be reduced were international humanitarian law better respected, were detainees treated with dignity um, and allowed to have contact with the outside world, were um, attacks um, and, 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 and fighting done with better respect for the principles of distinction, proportionality and precaution. And so how can we ensure uh, better respect for international humanitarian law? And I'll just mention four avenues, perhaps, um, that we have been pursuing um, alone or in partnership with others to, to achieve such better respect. One is about um, the investigations into um, violations of international humanitarian law in armed conflict situations. Why? Because, in fact, very often in the fog of war, it is not very clear um, whether international humanitarian law was respected or not. And so when we speak, for instance, to um, belligerents, very often um, the discussion stops at the facts because the facts are not clear. And so the next question then has to be, okay, but how have these facts been investigated? Has there been a certain independence, a certain thoroughness, a certain promptness of such investigations in order to really assert the facts and, if necessary, bring the perpetrators to account. And so we've published together with the Geneva Academy on International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights Law um, some guidelines on, on law and good practice on investigations in armed conflict. The second question is how do you influence belligerents in order to better respect IHL? So you can of course read the Geneva Conventions to them until you are green in the face, but that sometimes works, but not, a, not always. What does work sometimes, though, are other avenues which have to do with the self-understanding, for instance, of non-state armed groups about their values, about the cultural, um, um, the cultural roots in which they are uh, steeped, but in which also the civilian populations on which they depend are steeped. And so we published a. a um, a report called The Roots of Restraint in War, which basically explores um, through social, um, social science analysis, what could be ways of dialoguing with belligerents, dialoguing with parties to conflicts, to bring them to an attitude of respect for international humanitarian law through various forms. And it can be about uh, speaking about the law, it can be through hierarchies. Very often that's the case when you have, of course, very organized um, armed forces of states. But it can also be about engaging with um, other values that are equivalent to those of international humanitarian law. And this is sometimes the case, of course, with non-state armed groups, which are perhaps less steeped into the details of international humanitarian law. A third avenue, and I think this one is very important in contemporary conflict, is that in contemporary conflicts, no one fights alone. Uh, between every belligerent, often between sta uh, behind states, but mainly be behind every non-state armed group, there's another state. And that um, creates both challenges uh, because it um, dilutes the responsibility of the respective belligerents and it isn't always clear um, who was really responsible for um, a certain violation. But it also creates opportunities because those who are supporting, who are financing, who are training, who are supplying weapons to uh, belligerents have um, a certain amount of influence and have means in their hands to bring their partners to an, an attitude of respect for international humanitarian law. And so what we are doing at the moment is trying to dialogue with those parties that support uh, others 
uh, in how that influence can be used for better respect for international humanitarian law. And we're trying here again to look at best practices, to look at what some states have done to influence their partners, um, what some states have done to dialogue with their partners, etc., uh, how they train them and so forth in order to better respect international humanitarian law and to share that with others in order to show that this is uh, something that can be done, can give agencies who, to states who want to see better respect for international humanitarian law. And then lastly, a more academic uh, endeavor, which we do together with a number of, of law school clinics, which is called IHL in Action. And this is a bit to counter uh, a discourse against, um, you know, erosion of IHL and a sort of very negative discourse about um, the lack of respect for IHL. As I said before, there's no denying that lack of respect for IHL is, its, it, is a great challenge. However, this is not to say that IHL has not had immense protective value for many um, people in armed conflict situations. And in fact, when, when you talk to people in armed conflict situations, they believe in IHL and they believe IHL should be better respected. And so the IHL in Action database gives examples on where IHL has led to uh, respect and better protection of, of people suffering from armed conflict. So I want to leave you with that positive note um, of hope that uh, international humanitarian law has power, has protective power, and will continue to do so, and that it's a question of collective endeavor also to make it even stronger. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Cordula, for this uh, a really excellent and uh, comprehensive overview um, of the contemporary challenges um, to IHL and also the incredibly important work of the International Committee of the Red Cross um, in, in this respect. Um, I'm also happy to share with participants that uh, this seems to be um, IHL and ISCRC week at the CIL also, because on Friday, uh, there will be a lecture uh, organized together by CIL and, uh, and the ICRC on armed conflict and the environment, which was something I noticed you didn't have the time to, um, uh, to approach, but um, uh, all the participants are very welcome to register also for this Friday uh, seminar where we will have, among others, also Maria Leto from the International Law Commission, who was special rapporteur on the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflict. But I don't want to take any more time because I really want to open up uh, for the uh, discussion period for the Q&A. Um, so, dear participants, I think you have a lot of uh, material to ask questions, and I see already Robert uh, raising his hand. So, Robert, you have the floor for a live question. Excellent. Thanks very much. So, uh, and thank you very much for uh, the discussion today. It's been very enlightening, very um, insightful. Um, I think um, it's impressive the work that is done uh, that you do and that others, um, you know, um, do with you to advance uh, this very challenging area of law. My question is this, on this call or on this, in this webinar, there are folks from lots of different, um, you know, sectors of legal profession and beyond. Uh, some of us are in, in private practice. Um, others of us, I expect, are in NGOs. My question to you is, is what is helpful from your perspective, uh, from the private sector or from NGOs, to assist in the development of, of the norms you've described in international humanitarian law or otherwise? Thank you. Cordula, go ahead while we wait for other questions. Okay, great. Um, so, so there are so many things I could say. So how should I start? I think the first one is um, as citizens to counter the dehumanizing counterterrorism discourse, to uphold um, the humanity of the enemy, but also those who are um, affiliated with the enemy is, is a very important thing that every, every citizen, every NGO, the private sector can, can contribute to. That's the first thing. Um, then the landscape of NGOs is so broad that it's difficult to answer um, very specifically. You have NGOs that are very focused legally 
um, such as, um, you know, the International Commission of Jurists, where I worked before, such as um, uh, even Human Rights Watch, which will, you know, recall the obligations of, of belligerents um, and so forth. And so, of course, they, they do that work. You also have NGOs that are much more um, working on the ground, such as Save the Children or, or, or others like this. And so they're very specifically also working on um, on specific issues. Now, the private sector, I think, is becoming more interesting and more important now, particularly in the question of new technologies of warfare. When you look, for instance, at cyber technologies or at autonomy, uh, you know, autonomous uh, technologies, at artificial intelligence, these are um, computer systems, algorithms, platforms that are um, very often um, developed and run by the private sector, even when they are for, for instance, the, the defense industry. And so um, I think we will not be able to find universal agreements on limits um, that these technologies have to be imposed on when they are weaponized without multi-stakeholder engagement, which includes not only states, but also the private sector. You might have seen this was sort of quite big in, in the media a couple of years back was a, a call by um, Brad Smith from Microsoft of a Geneva Convention on uh, Cyber. Um, and I think uh, while, you know, one can dispute whether there's a need for a Geneva Convention on Cyber, which we would perhaps not necessarily say, but I think the important thing here was um, uh, an awareness that there is a weaponization of such systems and that this can entail humanitarian consequences and that those need to be addressed and they need to be addressed through multi-stakeholder processes. So I hope that goes, you know, that gives some um, sort of indications of, of this very multifaceted question that you posed. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions? Uh, either a live question. I'm trying Patricia, to see. We the have screen. a question from Giacomo. Oh, Giacomo. Um, yes, uh, Giacomo, do you want to take the floor? Go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me because it's a little bit out, uh, loud outside. Um, very well. Um, so, yeah, uh, thank you also from my side for that lecture. It was interesting to see how many problem fields there actually are currently. and. Um, I have two um, aspects to ask concerning, um, well, modern technologies. Um, the first one um, concerns the usage of um, virus, viruses and computer programs. Um, so uh, when there is um, yeah, an engagement uh, making the use of such programs and uh, digital technologies, um, how can those be classified? Are those kind of programs, are they weapons? Are they means or methods of warfare? Or is the classification unimportant because um, there is somehow the possibility to regulate it? And, and how far can you put those things that are completely apart from human action um, into, this, um, into this framework? And, and the second question is, even though I understand that uh, humanitarian law is there to ensure some minimum humanity during times of inhumanity, in how far um, are aspects like data protection also important? Um, I'm asking this because uh, I've read about a couple of cases where um, internally displaced people, people and some refugees have been tracked by retina scans, by huge databases, so that the conflict parties would have an exact overview on who is going where, who is going to flee to which region. And this also poses quite a huge danger for the for personality protection of those persons. And this is increasingly increasingly ongoing during armed conflict. So that's the question where these aspects are also um, or where the, those aspects are also dealt with during times of uh, conflict. Thanks a lot. We have Two also, very good yeah. questions. Please go ahead. Yes. Um, the first, the first one on on viruses and computer programs. They can be weaponized. Um, so what you would do as as an IHL lawyer, you would first look at 
is this um, is this computer network attack, for instance, or this um, you know botnet or so forth, is it being launched outside of an armed conflict situation or in an armed conflict situation? So you would first analyze the conflict situation, and just to give sort of very obvious examples, if it is launched against um, you know an, an an industrial system in Liechtenstein, it won't be within an armed conflict situation. If it is launched against um, the electricity grid um, of, you know, under the control of the Syrian government, it will be within an armed conflict situation. And then what you have to do is you have to look at what is it? international humanitarian law says that any attack, so the concept of attack is important, has to respect the rules of pro uh, distinction, proportionality, and, and, and precaution, which is basically to um, protect civilians against this attack, to, to put it simply. And an attack in international humanitarian law is defined as an act of violence um, in, in offense or defense. Now, acts of violence, of course, are traditionally seen as, you know, uh, throwing, you know, uh, launching uh, bombs or, or artillery. But the way you have to look at it is, is, does this act have a violent effect in the real world? And if it destroys electric, electrical infrastructure or indeed any other civilian in, or any other infrastructure, then it has to be conceived as an act of violence because it has the same effect in the end as if it was um, done through, uh, through a kinetic means. And then once you've defined that, you will have to say, yes, this is a cyber attack and it has to apply the rules of proportionality, distinction and proportion. Does that make sense? And then your other question about data protection is hugely relevant um, and very pertinent. And indeed it is in fact a new humanitarian issue that we are seeing and that and which makes civilian populations vulnerable. And so to come back on, on your question, uh, you know, to make a loop between your first, with your first question, for instance, um, what is protected under international humanitarian law are civilian objects. And the question is, are private data, personal data objects within the meaning of international humanitarian law? And that is a disputed question because it's a new question. Um, and from the perspective of, of our, from our perspective, at least essential data, which is essential for the functioning of, uh, of people, such as their bank data, their medical data, has to be uh, understood as a civilian object because it has to be protected against attacks from belligerents. Um, and then uh, more practically, we've also at the ICRC, so we've been very attuned to this question of, of data protection, particularly in the context of, of migration that you have um, talked about. Um, and we've launched a handbook on data protection for humanitarians, which you can find on our website as well. Um, and what's interesting here is you still need personal data in order to maintain family links. And one of, the main, um, one of the main objectives of international humanitarian law, but also of Red Cross and Red Crescent Society, so the German Red Cross, you know, the, the Syrian Red Crescent and so forth, is to maintain family links of people who are separated in war, because separation of families is, is a huge side effect of wars. And it is, of course, now also a side effect of um, oh, thank you uh, for the for the um, for the for the link here, and it is also a huge side effect of migration. And so, in fact, Red Cross and Red Crescent societies have often collect personal data, as we have done for the past 150 years, in order to reunite families. So you will collect the data of, you know, children who are separated or of detainees to say, okay, so um, who are you? Where are you from? What's your name? Who's your family? In order to be able to then um, link that person back to their family. And so what we are doing at the moment, and this is very important to us, is we need to protect this personal data that we are collecting against um, unlawful or indeed, um, how should I say, um, 
um, not well-intended seizure by states or other parties to conflict. And so we are at the moment as a movement of the Red Cross and Red Crescent in dialogue with states um, in order to protect that uh, data which is of humanitarian importance and that we need um, and that and that civilians want to share with us in order to keep uh, you need to keep their digital identity in order to keep their family links but that we need to protect and so we are also at the moment trying to find digital ways of creating secure systems to uh, deposit the, those data Thank you so much, Cordula. I think we're approaching the end, but we have one uh, last question. I'm not sure that it's a question from Tangi. She has put it on the um, on the uh, chat. Um, I'm I will read it out. Perhaps um, it's about implementation of IHL. Uh, so the question is: uh, the implementation of IHL rules is challenging. How can states improve the respect and implementation of IHL rules today? So that's the big question <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and, and an important that's one. That's the big it's question. The... It goes back to... <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it goes back to my last point, of course. And, and, and you know, perhaps that's, um, that's a chapter that I would recommend uh, also perhaps if, if you're interested to read in our report on, on challenges. Again, there, there are many avenues. And what we are arguing perhaps is that the respect for IHL begins at home. So first of all, um, abstain from violations. That's the easiest. So do not torture, do not ill-treat, uh, uh, do not deliberately target civilians, etc. cetera. Um, then there are more onerous obligations, for instance, such as you know, connect families, uh, ensure the basic needs of populations under your control and so forth. Um, but um, it is ultimately a question of political will. You can't, belligerents can respect IHL if they choose to do so. And so it is a question of political will to do so. All the rest that follows is technical matters. And as I said, the technical matters are addressed in this report. We also at the last international conference of Red Cross and Red Crescent in December 2019, there was a resolution by all states uh, as well as the Red Cross and Red Crescent Nas Nas National Societies about um, ways to improve respect for IHL. So, for instance, training of their armed forces is, is a very important part of, of improving respect. Adapting their legislation, for instance, so as to uh, make war crimes um, the subject of prosecution. Um, about... Um, you know, dissemination IHL, about, for instance, having IHL, national IHL committees, which can be committees in which ministries of justice, defense, foreign affairs, and so on, come together to discuss issues of IHL. So there's a lot of specific activities that states can take and a lot of um, infra, you know, architecture uh, and, and activities that can, that can make respect for IHL more efficient. But ultimately, it's a question of political will. Thank you so much, Cordula. I think we're going to end here. here or, um, of course, there are many other questions that um, still um, are there to be asked, but uh, you probably, I think we all share the, the sentiment that you've painted uh, a grim picture because I think the, the world outlook today is, is quite grim, but at the same time, uh, you ended um, your presentation on a positive note. Uh, and indeed, um, it's very interesting and it's something that we don't see. We normally see when IHL doesn't work, we normally does, don't see when it works. Uh, but in, it's it's uh, really, there are many success stories and uh, what I think Giacomo mentioned that bringing humanity to very inhumane uh, um, uh, situations is really the key role of the ICRC. And, and sometimes we don't see so much uh, that part, but it's there and we're sure, we are sure that it's there. So thanks again, uh, Cordula, for taking the time um, uh, for to being with us today. I, the participants has, have certainly learned a lot and enjoyed and um, listening to your insights and learning a bit more about uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross and the challenges 
of IHL today. Uh, we um, will give you a, a virtual <laughs> round of applause because this is what we can do <laughs> um, these days. Uh, but we're very proud to have had you today. And uh, thank you so much uh, for having uh, been with us on behalf of Nunolfer, myself and the Academy and all of the participants. So we'll see you uh, tomorrow for the participants. We'll continue with Professor Jalo's lecture. He will continue also on the topic of IHL and, and, and uh, we will have the opportunity to further debate these issues. And then if you're um, uh, free or if you're not at the time, but you can still follow it uh, on Facebook, the lecture on Friday on armed conflict and uh, in the environment. So thank you so much once again, Cordula, for being with us uh, today. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Cordula. Thank you, Patricia, uh, for everybody attending. If you enjoyed this lecture, the video will be available tomorrow on the CIL website and YouTube channel, and you'll be able to share this important information with others. You can also follow us on our social media channels to be able to find out more about CIL events. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.